Welcome. I'm Jessica Kimple Johnson, and I'm the manager of the Now Lab on the History and Principles of Democracy of the Democracy Initiative at UVA. I am delighted to introduce another conversation today that is part of our Touchstones of Democracy series. The series focuses on key events, places, thinkers, and texts that help us understand the history, principles, and practices of democracy. Today's conversation will be on remembering Algerian independence and will feature architectural historians, Sheila Crane of UVA and Samia Henny of Cornell. I'd also like to note that some of the discussion today will be related to an exhibition that Samia has created and is currently being hosted by the Democracy Initiative, which is located in the Bond House at UVA. The exhibition is free and open to visitors, so we do hope that you will come by. One last item to mention is that about midway through the conversation today, Sheila and Samia will be taking audience questions, so please feel free to submit those using the Q&A function. And with that, Sheila, I will hand the conversation over to you. Thank you so much, Jessica, and thank you to everyone at the Democracy Institute. Um, it is a singular honor to welcome Samia Henney to the University of Virginia, to the Touchstones of Democracy survey, series, and to talk to her today about her work on the history of Algeria. Um, while we are, uh, the event is really framed as remembering Algerian independence, Samia is really going to help us think through the critical period leading up to independence, um, especially through the extraordinary exhibition that, that you just heard referenced, Discrete Violence, Architecture and the French War in Algeria that's cur currently on view in the Julian Bond House, the home of UVA's Democracy Initiative. Uh, Dr. Samia Henny describes herself as a historian, a theorist, an educator, and an exhibition maker of the built, destroyed, and imagined environments. She is assistant professor of the history of architecture and urban development at Cornell University's College of Architecture, Art, and Planning. But she's joining us today from Marseille, um, where she's spending the year between Marseille and Aix-en-Provence as the inaugural Albert Hirschman Chair for Identity Passions Between Europe and the Mediterranean at the Institute for Advanced Study in X. And there she's working on several important new projects, um, which I hope we'll get a chance to hear a little bit about today as well, including an edited volume um, called Des entitled Deserts Are Not Empty, which was based on the 2020 Preston H. Thomas Memorial Lectures um, that Dr. Henney convened at Cornell, and also her eagerly awaited book, Colonial Toxicity, The French Army in the Sahara. Uh, Dr. Henney is the author, also the author of the award-winning book, Architecture of Counter-Revolution, The French Army in Northern Algeria, which was published in English in 2017, um, and two years later in 2019 came out in a French edition. Um, her book, Architecture of Counter-Revolution, was awarded the 2020 Spiro Kostov Book Award by the Society of Architectural Historians, and among other awards, the 2018 Best Book in the Theory of Art by the Festival International du Livre de l'Art et du Film. Uh, so her book examines the complicity of architecture and planning in the large-scale projects of territorial restructuring mass housing production and forced displacement that were undertaken by the French military during the Algerian revolution, the Algerian war for independence from 1954 to 1962. Um, and the significance of the events that, that Samia traces in her book um, and that are also highlighted in the exhibition really can't be overstated. Um, given the protracted and the extreme violence of a war that was not acknowledged formally as such by the French state until 1999. Um, and there's much that we could talk about in relationship um, to a war that really followed on over a century of French colonization um, in which similar um, strategies of mass forced displacement play an important role. Um, but I wanted to start by asking, um, asking 
Samia Henny to talk a little bit about the exhibition and its relationship to her book. Um, the exhibition, Discrete Violence, that really brings together key archival documents unearthed um, in, in the archives that uh, shed some light on the devastating scale of systematic forced displacement and the creation of a large scale series of camps um, called Camp Humont as part of a project of regrouping um, that um, the details of which are continue to be disputed, um, but th which the exhibition and the materials that you were working with, Samia, help to shed new light on. Um, and I should just say that we um, are delighted to have this exhibition here at UVA, um, but it was first shown at, um, in Zurich at the Ete Ash and has traveled to many venues, and I'll just cite a few of those. Um, the New Institute in Rotterdam, the University of Johannesburg, and La Colonie in Paris. So I'd like to welcome you, um, but also ask you if you could um, set the stage a little um, by giving us a sense of the organization of the exhibition and its situatedness within um, both the, the war and the longer history of French colonization. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila, for this really generous uh, introduction. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you also to the team of uh, Touchstones of Democracy. Thank you to UVA for hosting the exhibition, for organizing the workshops, but also this conversation. I think it's really crucial. I would also like to thank uh, yeah, Je Jessica Campbell-Johnson, Laurent Dubois, Jennifer Sessions, Feriel Meyer Boutarou, and a very, very, very special thanks to Emily Marx, who was able to um, coordinate and, and, and set up the exhibition um, at UVA. So thank you very much, um, uh, Emily, for your work. Um, I also want to thank the architecture school uh, installation team and all the individuals who really supported this project. So thank you very much. As Sheila mentioned, um, I prepared a, a a kind of presentation that um, give us a sense um, of the context of the exhibits, uh, the shortcomings, the possibilities, and yeah, some of the difficulties I also had with the sources that I worked with. Unfortunately, it wasn't easy. So yeah, maybe I can share my screen, Sheila. I hope it works. Let's try. Yes, here we are. Is it okay? Does it work, Sheila? You can see? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, as Sheila mentioned, it's it's really the, the exhibition um, is in, in dialogue, in conversation with the book, uh, Architecture of Counter Revolution, the French Army in Northern Algeria. Um, while writing this book, I um, worked with some of um, the uh, military archival documents. We also interviewed people and they, I somehow um, realized that some of the, of the documents are very problematic. So I thought maybe one should uh, try to thematize them instead of publish them in a book. Um, and the book, as Sheila mentioned, was also translated into French in 2019. And, it um, aims at tracing the relationships between planning architecture, military operations, and colonial practices. Um, when I think of military operation, I'm also thinking of the Vichy regime, eh, which was also somehow circulating, or the knowledge that was produced there was also circulating from the Vichy regime to the colonies and then back to to, to France, um, and I think some of this conversation happened also today in some of these um, workshops that you brilliantly organized. Um, it's also book, both the book, but I think all my work, <laughs> to be honest with you, is um, a reaction to this very uh, term, positive, and it's this very 
um, sentence that existed in 2005, existed for only one year, but that very year marked uh, some of the debates, but it's also a sign of the existence of the evaluation or the one-sided evaluation of the French of French colonies in North Africa, so namely in uh, Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia. So I uh, try to show work on the non-positive role of French present uh, overseas. Um, I also would like to really highlight the fact that the Algerian revolution or the Algerian war of independence or the Algerian uh, um, war for national liberation is not only to be read between these two countries, uh, France and Algeria, but it has to be read, understood, and researched um, uh, in a much longer uh, uh, life, uh, uh, the life of the French empire, but also of Europe, European Union, but also of uh, other empires that were always in relationship as well with uh, colonial and imperial practices um, of France. Um, it's, I think it's what's also important in the exhibition, but also in my work, is to understand the, the war, um, but also the insistence of France to stay in Algeria to the resources that are in the southern part of uh, Algeria, so the Sahara. That's also why the subtitle of the book is Northern Algeria, because of this very fact of the separation or the attempt at separating the north from the south for this very region. On the one hand, the uh, presence or the existence uh, or the discovery of oil and gas and other natural resources in the Sahara, but also on the other side, um, the use of the Sahara as a nuclear firing uh, field. Uh, so the Sahara was um, the site for the first nuclear bombs uh, of France from 1960 and 1966. So I would really like to um, invite you to read, understand, and work on these very moments in relationship to all these aspects, uh, which I'm aware it's not easy, but um, um, it's, it opens up other kinds of conversation and discussions. And it also traces all the circulation and exportation um, in this case of counterinsurgency, counter-revolutionary measures to other Western powers. So to be very, very uh, maybe brief and uh, to try to understand discrete violence, the French army, the, the architecture and the French war in Algeria, I tried, I tried to um, divide this into three extremely brief uh, and concise uh, parts, the camps, so what we are talking about, the sources, what we are working with, and how we can tell this story through the sources that in this very case, I opted to work with. Discrete violence, we can discuss the title maybe later in the Q&A, but um, maybe I can go back to it in a, in a minute. Um, it really, it's really about the absence of war um, signs and ab about the absence of violence in most of the uh, visual documents, especially the photographs that I work with. So that's why um, there, there is this term discrete, but it's also by violence, but we can definitely talk about this in the Q&A. So as I said, it's really part of this, of this, of the book. Uh, there are three chapters, unveiling the first camps, Vichy, Gossi, and Constantine, and then from permanent camps to, to villages that try to um, highlight or to trace and uh, to understand these, um, the, these histories, but also stories around the camps that the French army called Les Centres de Regroupement. And in the book and also in the exhibition, I show that there is, there are no signs of uh, centers and also of regroupments. I, I would even call them concentration camp, knowing that this both of these terms were forbidden during the war because of the Second World War, of course, but also Maurice Papon was, um, uh, let's say, behind this uh, uh, directive to not use the term camp and not use the term concentration. So that's why we have this term centre de regroupement. And what are these centres de regroupement, which I would from now on call camps? Huh? So regrouping camps, but I think 
camps, it's much more straightforward. So um, with the outbreak of the, of the uh, Algerian revolution, um, the French mapped most of the strongholds of this insurrection as they were calling it. So of the revolution, as we can see in this map, most of them are located in rural areas, not in urban areas. And these rural areas were areas where the French army had really difficulties um, to access them because of their remoteness, but because of their unfamiliarity with the territory, the geography, the population of these areas. And therefore they created a, what they called zone interdict, forbidden zones. In, in, as you can see in this map, the gray, the dark gray areas are where all these forbidden zones were located. It happened, of course, gradually. This is a map of 1959, um, but it started from 1950. Four, and in the book, I uh, say that it never ended actually until 1962, although previous um, uh, researchers tried to show that some of these camps um, were uh, um, disappeared during the war, but I would rather say, no, they continue to exist, but they were called differently. And that's why it's extremely difficult to locate the these camps during these um, eight years of, uh, of war. So here we, we can also see that um, uh, while they sealed off the border with uh, Tunisia and Morocco, they created even larger uh, forbidden zones. And from these forbidden zones, the, the, um, the population, so uh, humans, but also animals were uh, for, forbidden or they uh, were uh, uh, evacuated. So no human, no animal life was allowed in these zones and therefore they created, the French army created what they called the Centre de Regroupement. As you can see in this map, and this map is also um, exhibited um, at, uh, at UVA, um, that maybe we can talk about uh, this map later. Um, it's not coming from public archives, so it's a private um, document or a document that was um, uh, found by Michel Cornaton in Algeria, and I was able to find it after a couple of um, attempts at asking him um, if he had any kind of evidence to really trace the scale, but also the location of, of, all, of all these camps. Um, so that's uh, um, very briefly, like the, 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 the raison d'etre of, uh, of these camps. Very quickly, they created, the French army created the SAS, Section Administrative Specialisé. They were special uh, military units, mili um, yeah, army units that um, were responsible for the creation of the camp, or for the control of the population, the um, collection uh, of um, intelligence and other um, civil um, activities as well at the same time. Um, with their military, uh, uh, let's say, assignments as well. So the, the camps or the, the, the nature, the status or the conditions of the camp varied uh, from camp to camp, from SAS to SAS, from um, uh, director or let's say officer, officer to officer. So the, 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 the leaders of these, um, of these areas, so we could find tents like this, but also these kinds of settlements. Uh, it took me really ages to find a, a, pi a picture, an image, a photograph with a watchtower. Um, that's also part of this discrete violence because most of these photographs that, you are, that we are watching right now are coming from uh, the SCA, uh, C the Service Cinématographique des Armées. Today it's called the ECPAD, Établissement de Communication de Production Audiovisuelle de la Défense. So they still exist as a, as a military office and they are still producing uh, photographs and audiovisual materials in um, war zones where the French army is active, like in Mali today. So this kind of, of photograph, it's extremely rare, rare meaning that uh, there are um, uh, photographs that are showing these camps, but very, very few with barbed wire, with uh, watchtower. Um, in 1959, um, so as I said before, it started in 1954, and then in 1959, thanks to a uh, leak by um, um, Michel Rocard, who was a very young 
um, he's a uh, inspector of finances and he was uh, doing his internship in Algeria and he visited some of these camps. He wrote a report and then he licked it. So thanks to his work, these camps became um, known by the public, uh, um, um, by the public in France. Uh, so it was, they were until 1959, quite top secret. So Algerians knew about them. They also tried to make sure that other media know about uh, the existence of this camp. So, but with this very moment in 1959, and therefore, and that, uh, that's also why we have in the exhibition, uh, the repetition of this media scandal on the walls. I will talk a little bit about it later, but let's keep in mind really this moment of 1959 where there is this media scandal and there is a denunciation of the outrageous conditions of these camps. So from that moment on, um, the goal was uh, uh, the, 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 he came back to power and he appointed uh, De Louvrier, Jacques De Louvrier, who um, was the governor general of Algeria. And he said that he will take care personally um, of these camps and he will launch a um, national program in Algeria called Les Mille Villages. That was, it's another kind of, I and we can discuss this also in the Q&A, um, this uh, uh, national plan was extremely confusing. Uh, some of the, I mean, this is an anecdote, but it's also ridiculous, but that's part of the history of this Mille Villages. Uh, some of the military officers thought that they had to build 1,000 villages. So can you imagine uh, there were about 3,774 uh, camps. So they, they thought that they had to diminish. I mean, it was really a big mass. And that's also something that I was interested in in the book. So I tried really to understand what happened to them. But at the also, and I show that these were not villages. As you can see here, they are still camps. So that's the naissance of the mid village. So that's a little bit this very quickly, the history of, uh, of the raison d'etre of these camps. What's extremely important to know is that the creation, and I'm quoting here, one of the uh, military officers, uh, French military officers saying that the creation of le regroupement, the regroupment is the most effective means for subtracting the population from the influence of the rebel. This kind of um, uh, idea of principle is also very much linked with these theories and practices of modern warfare, counterinsurgency, counterrevolution, psychological warfare, and all these terms were used at the time. Today we call it counterinsurgency. So, for example, the war that has been waged in Afghanistan is a counterinsurgency or are counterinsurgency operations. What's extremely relevant to know is the, that the population, I'm quoting here again is the challenge of the adversary as well as the law enforcement officials. The population is the key to the problem because success will belong to those who engage the population in their actions. So in other words, the, the entire population of Algeria at the time became suspect. Um, so there is no difference between enemy and friend. That's how, you know, like regular warfare operates and here the entire population Become, became a suspect. So that's a bit um, how to, let's say, frame it, how to understand it. It's also extremely important as a historian, as um, Sheila mentioned of the built destroyed and imagined environment, or in other words, architecture and planning, but I, I, I do um, uh, insist on the destroyed environment, but that because I think it's also the role of architecture historians to uh, deal with these environments um, here you can see that for the insurgent, and here you know, we, one should use this uh, between brackets. So for um, the French, the insurgents are the Algerians, so the revolutionary. Uh, there are the insurgent, the counterinsurgents are the French, so the military. So here you can see that uh, for the insurgent, the ideal territory is to uh, be dispersed, and for the counterinsurgents, so the French army, is to be concentrated. Um, what's also important to know is that this SAS, the Section Administrative Specialisé, the work of the regrouping camps, the work of uh, the control of the population, the indoctrination of the population, 
um, was practiced um, elsewhere before Algeria, and then it was uh, somehow um, per, yeah, uh, uh, developed there, and then uh, written, theorized, and exported to other parts of the world, mainly in North and South Americas. And in 2005, so very recently, there was this um, report called the, six, the, the Specialized Administrative Sections in Algeria, a instrument for stabiliz stabilization. And it was used for the conflict zone, war zones uh, in Bosnia, Afghanistan, and Kosovo. So this is just to say that it did not stop in 1962, it continued, yeah, which is extremely important. So what kind of sources, and that's what was really for me a key here, um, the, the, uh, the media scandal, and you see when you um, visit the exhibition at uh, UVA, uh, the, this media scandal, this collection of um, newspaper articles that were published or uh, issued in 1959, you can see that the terms that were being used at the time were very different. You know, some were using camps, some were using concentration villages, uh, centers. It was quite chaotic, and uh, I think it's also interesting to see or to understand what kind of language um, the media used at the time. Um, we have these kinds of photographs from the SCA, the Service Cinematographique des Armées. So they are black and white photographs that are quite, let's say they were commissioned uh, um, or they commissioned to a very good uh, um, photographs to, to produce this, this, uh, this material. So I had really difficulties with these kinds of photographs and that's why they, they, can, they are not you know, celebrated. They are not really framed as a photograph, but they are for me documents as, they, as the other kinds of documents. So here is really to document, to show the diversity of all these, um, all these camps, of the, the presence of, of, um, of the watchtower, of the barbed wire, of uh, the search here, you see that this is a war zone, but the absence of weapons was really astonishing. And from all these photographs, this is another kind of search. They are asking um, uh, the evacuated population to surrender somehow, but you can't see any, any, any kind of um, sign of war, of, of violence. So it's also like the question was how to depict this kind of of violence. Um, this is a, a moment where the population, especially women, elderly uh, women and children, were concentrated in one part. And uh, what's, um, what I also try to do is to connect this with uh, raw materials of, um, of some of the footages that I found there, uh, which I will discuss very, very quickly. So here you see the daily life somehow of the population, the population that were uh, that was evacuated were asked to build their own camp. Um, maps that show, in this case, the forbidden zone. That they are not very, very clear, but at least um, you can see the the composition of the tribes and of the population there. We have very straightforward um, uh, statements. Uh, in this case, this is a um, report, a communication that was only among the French army. So, so these kinds of documents are somehow contradicting what we are seeing also in this, in this photograph. So for example, le but premier, so the first uh, uh, aim objective of the construction site is to allow more psychological con contact, contact between, or more intimate and psychological contact between or among all the men of, uh, of the villages, but it's also a way to say that France is really determined to stay in Algeria. So these kind of documents were um, internal, they were only meant to be distributed among the French army and to show them together with, with, uh, with the photograph, together with other kinds of uh, records and, and, and audiovisual documents, they somehow try to depropagandize, if I may use this term, these um, photographs that I have really issues with. So here, it's again straightforward. The politique du regroupement uh, is to isolate, protect, and uh, control the, the population. So these kinds of, um, of documents um, are also showing the 
once the population is uh, concentrated into these camps, the, the psychological action was um, had to uh, be implemented. Uh, this was really uh, a kind of psychological terrorism to say that you have to support the French um, action and the French violence. I also, in other venues, not at UVA, uh, choose the number of uh, videos that are like uh, uh, raw footage, footage, not edited without sound. They cut the sound that they tried to select only moments where in this very case, as we just saw that the actors between brackets are really looking at the camera. They are also trying to understand this, this territory. They are also trying to show um, or, or, or um, to, um, to capture, to occupy again, this territory. So I also showed the, bomb, the bombing of uh, the villages, the evacuation of the population, the creation of the forbidden zones, and here the weapon is uh, there. So that's uh, uh, another kind of layer also in this exhibition. What's also very important is to try to show the making of these uh, documents. So in order to understand that this is not you know, found material, this is all orchestrated, all extremely well planned. And um, this is a part of a, a private um, photographs of one of the filmmakers that I was able to uh, interview and to um, convince that he uh, accepted to borrow and to lend me his private photographs. And this is also to show that those videos that we are, we can watch today without the sound, without the propaganda are also orchestrated. And, and there, again, we can see weapons. We can see that even the cameraman was, um, yeah, uh, uh, always ready in case of attack or offense. So that's also part of, uh, of the narrative of the layers that I really wanted to um, um, offer to visitors. So to really conclude here, the exhibition, there were, this is like the really display of the exhibition. I tried to use as um, less as possible. <laughs> so we have really three formats or three, um, um, let's say display instruments, so one could say, or media. One was the wall, so this is where you have this uh, wallpaper tapestry of uh, of newspaper articles of the, of 1959, where there is a denunciation and the, and and um, somehow like a rage, a shock of the population of the of the media at that time with all kinds of terms, all kinds of maps, all kinds of histories, of stories, of experiences, of, uh, of um, yeah, of denunciation. So that's the, the first thing that people see when they enter. So you wonder what's going on, what's this, you know, what, what's, what's the message there? And then you have tables or vitrines with documents and then be, uh, with screens, screens on the floor showing um, the daily life, uh, showing the construction of the camps, uh, showing some of these um, um, searches and military measures that were happening while the camps were being built by the population. And sometimes, you know, the, the, we can also see that there were really uh, issues of um, hunger as well. Eh? And then on this, um, this is now we are um, at UVA. So when you go to UVA, when you, when you uh, uh, would like to uh, see the exhibition that Emily brilliantly uh, set up there, um, you see on the uh, left hand side, the, the wallpaper with all these uh, newspaper articles on the, um, on the tables. Uh, uh, we, the first thing that, for me was really important to add, to show, to create also this awkward situation is a, a mirror, a mirror that would reflect the newspaper articles, all the terms, all the, um, uh, the, the media scandal of 1959. So wherever you go, you have to be confronted, of course, with your side, because that's what, <laughs> what a mirror does, but also with this newspaper articles on, on the wall. And on these, um, on these tables, on these vitrines, you will, there is always a, um, um, let's say, a page or a, 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 a 
um, let's say, uh, 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 yeah, it's not a page, how do you say, like a format, an US, an A4 format that uh, tells you a little bit about what we are looking at. So there is a kind of caption that is um, describing the content that we are looking at. It, it is an exhibition that one needs to engage with the materials, to read, to understand, to re-watch it again and again in order to uh, understand or to uncover all these different layers, but also all these different topics. So we have um, topics of in, in each uh, in each um, uh, uh, vitrine or in, in each table. We have um, uh, the uh, archival documents or text that is somehow contradicting the photographs. We have maps. I also. Um, Try to highlight, as you can see in pink here, on this on the uh, uh, lower uh, re uh, left right side um, of the of the table. You can see there are like highlights in pink to capture the attention or call the attention of the audience. So, for example, in this very case, this is a zone interdit, a forbidden zone. So, uh, the, in this very documents, there are three kinds of zones and there you can also um, unearth this violence you know, the, because of, um, of the directive that is saying that no human life is allowed, no animal life is allowed there and any kind of movement can be uh, eliminated right away. So all these levels of information are being juxtaposed there and are, be, are being um, or are trying to create a dialogue or a conversation between all these levels of information. So between the journalists and the opinion, the French opinion or the public between or among all these uh, military officers, uh, between really high ranked military officers that are somehow sharing extremely or top secret um, uh, directive. And it's really all part of this same kind of roof that I just, uh, really trying to create to show all these dynamics, all these contradictions and all this violence that was uh, being, let's say, um, or that was operating at that very time. So we at UVA, we had two screens that already were there. So we used them and on one of the screens, we have a slideshow with all these um, so-called villages again they are center they are camps so we have like a slideshow with the 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 area photographs and also the names sometimes the date sometimes not of these villages on on the other side we have the the a kind of video that is uh, showing the and, and, and depicting the scale of uh, this operation um and it's also like zooming into into um into some of these parts. So that's really um, a, a kind of overview, extremely quick overview, but again, I invite you to um, try to maybe visit the exhibition and there are much more information there. And I hope that this complexity can be really um, uh, easily accessed during your visit of the exhibition. So thank you so much again to all the people who made this um, project, this exhibition possible. Thank you so much, Samia. There's so much that we could dive into now um, to unpack. And I wanted to start in part to uh, perhaps for members of the audience for whom this is the first introduction um, to the material that you've been working with, for you to reflect a little on um, what you see as critical continuities between longer term strategies of militarized colonial Ad administration and violence, um, and what, um, what, how the new military or organization that emerges, um, whose operations, documentation, um, and this new apparatus of photography and film, um, how you might situate this material, both in terms of a longer term shared 
colonial militarized project of mapping forced displacement um, and, yeah. and how that shifts in this critical period. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a really crucial question. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah, I think the, um, the fact that these camps were called centers, you know, says a lot about what was not allowed to be thought or to be said, to be even almost experienced. Um, I think this SCA, Service Cinematographic Désarmée, was so trained to produce really propaganda, uh, mm -hmm. to produce audiovisuals um, that were somehow um, not defending, but somehow um, legitimizing the French presence in Algeria. So um, the narrative was that, you know, we are building these uh, villages for rural populations who are uh, being um, threatened by the members of the FLN, Front de Liberation Nationale, the National Liberation Front. So like th that's the that's the kind of narrative. So so the the, the kind of audiovisuals uh, uh, that were produced are extremely polished, extremely orchestrated, and somehow they yeah. If you watch one of those videos that were produced and that were also screened in cinemas and movie theaters at the time, you know, in France and in other countries, they were almost um, uh, fetishizing what was happening. Uh, when I watch some of these materials with the students in the US, you know, they think, oh, this is really Hollywood, you know. Also the kind of, of uh, music, the kind of terms, the kinds of narrative that was being um, produced there was extremely problematic. And one of the things that I did is to cut completely the sound is to, not uh, work with edited materials, but to really ask for this footage, raw material, the roche, they, call, they were called. And the SEA said, we don't normally, we don't share this with the researchers. It's just what, you know, you have to work with what we have. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, that's not what I'm looking for because I'm trying to uh, um, exhibit the built and destroyed environment and, you know, in your, <laughs> videos you are celebrating what I am not interested in. So it was like a very, very long um, negotiation with them. And then after some years and some insistence, and you can imagine, <laughs> they finally accepted and, and were really open to, to that. So to situate it within a longer, let's say, period, uh, it's, um, I think, uh, uh, it, it's extremely difficult to show what was happening. It's extremely difficult to depict the reality. So yeah, it's a, it's a total, let's say, fiction. And that's why also this making of, um, for me, is really important to, 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 to see also in the exhibition, to say, OK, this is what you are looking at might not be what was happening. And this, you have audience. The audience should be really aware of that. I think what's extremely important to also highlight is the exportation of uh, not the visuals, but of the policies. So while the, you know, the, the media or while um, uh, some of the civil um, administration authorities were dealing you know, with the UN, with uh, international politics, the French army was exporting, um, you know, what was happening, for example, with the Battle of Algiers to North and South uh, America, uh, but also these uh, military operations, they were called also pacification, pacification, and uh, as I say, it's not peacemaking, eh? it's the opposite, it's really waging a war. So all these so-called pacification measures uh, where the population needs to be controlled over um, monitored and um, even uh, 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 brainwashed was part of these counterinsurgency or pacification measures. And I it's um, fascinating both to see 
the ways in which you move to disrupt that smooth creation <laughs> of messaging um, in the exhibition. And I, I wanted to bring us back to the map, um, bec partly because this really is a, a history that requires operating on a territorial scale uh, for you as a historian, um, a, a, a history in which the, 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 the politics of mapping are so wrapped up in the, the militarized project. Um, but I know for you also, um, having, putting your hands on and allowing us as an audience to, to see the map that you uncovered is a critical part of uh, the work that you're doing in this, in, um, with these intersecting projects. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that map its critical importance and how you situate it within a technology that is a militarized <laughs> product, especially in, in the history of, of um, French colonization and yeah. map making. No, it's, a, it's an extremely, yeah, it's a really important um, part of this project. So maybe to know a little bit about this map, um, so with the first um, iteration of the exhibition, I didn't have it. So the first one was in, at the ETH in Zurich in 2017. Eh? So the book came out with the map and it was like almost two, three weeks before the, pub the publication. So I'm, I'm so grateful to the Gitte Alphalan who accepted to stop everything <laughs> and change it. And somehow, um, while working um, in Vincennes or on, on the French military archives, while working at the um, uh, overseas archives or colonial archives in Aix-en-Provence, while interviewing people who either were part of the execution of this uh, um, of this uh, counter this regrouping camps, or those who were subjugated to to this displacement. Um, I, I always tried to, of course, understand the context, their experiences, but also if they had any kind of visuals, uh, photographs, maps, anything. I also tried to draw with one, uh, with some of the evacuated population who were about 12, 10, 12 years at the time to draw like memory maps of, of the camps. But, it was extremely difficult because of the traumatic conditions of, of the camps. And I'm not a psychiatrist, so I'm, I, I was really, you know, I'm like, okay, let, I really respect this. And so let's not go there. Um, although I do have them and I, I promise not to share them. Um, and while interviewing some of either researchers or military officers, Many times, I, 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 every time I ask the same question, do you by any chance found anything, any photograph, any map, anything that you know, testified to the existence, but also to the location of these camps? And the, you know, some were like, like always the same, the same, the same thing, but some were you know, promising to uh, look for more. And in, with the Michel Cornaton, he's, um, he passed away, unfortunately, um, he, two, two years, 2020, so we are 20, so two years ago, unfortunately, he, I, he was really, really crucial also in, in this project and understanding, for example, even the work of Bourdieu or the non-work of Bourdieu towards this class. And, and um, he was in Algeria during the Algerian Revolution, so during the war, he was there. And then once the war ended in 1962, he came back and he wrote a dissertation on these camps, but more on the sociology of, of the camps. And uh, so he did go several times um, after the independence. And um, I, 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 each time I asked him, like, hey, you haven't found anything. I mean, after all these years, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe. So maybe, I don't know which, like after how many times, maybe the eighth time or the eighth meeting, he said, look, I, I really have something now for you. 
um, and he showed me that this very, very large map, it was printed, he laid it, the, uh, uh, he was you know, open, um, and, 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 and that for me was like a revelation, because in none of the archives, yeah, there was, they were always saying the same thing, yeah, we didn't keep anything, you know, we didn't have maps, and we didn't, we don't know, of course, eh? um, knowing between brackets that all the um, documents that are printed uh, 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 confidential, top secret or secret today, or especially on 1st of January 2020, they, are, they have been classified after being declassified. So most of the documents that, are, that have been used for the writing of that book and many other books around the world, they are today classified. Eh? So that's really something between brackets. But to go back to the map, um, he said that this is a map that he was able to find when he went back after the independence to Algeria. And this is a map that the Algerian uh, government drew after uh, the independence and they located all the camps and they number them and they, there is together with this map there is a report uh, a kind of I can't remember like 300 400 pages report with the name of the camp with the people with like a kind of um, investigation or survey of this camp so one of the researchers um, Fabien Sacrist uh, he, um, he, he, he wrote a dissertation on, on the camp so he now have the 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 this uh, survey and he's working on um, digitalize it and I think we will. I really insisted that this should be really open to the public. So we will be working on uh, making it um, open to the public, but together with the map. And so this map was published um, in the book. Um, it exists. So we have it. We have it. So we can. We are now. Um, showing it, um, it's gonna be, yeah, uh, accessible. Um, in the first iteration, I didn't have it, so it, I couldn't show it. And then with, I think in Paris uh, at La Colonie or the former colony, which closed now, we printed like a six meter um, uh, map and some of the displaced, formerly displaced people came to uh, try to find the, their camps or try to find where their family or a member of their family were, have been evacuated during the war. I want to be sure that we take time to open things up to um, our audience and please feel free. There are a few questions in the Q&A, but feel free to add your questions. Um, but let me just, let me, let me take advantage of the opportunity to ask at least one more question, which is to circle back to what you mentioned, Samia. I mean, I think you've you've spoke quite elo eloquently about the challenges and the modes of operation you've tried to employ, especially in the exhibition, mm -hmm. to disrupt um, mm -hmm. replicating the priorities and the perspective of the military archives with which you're working. Um, and, I, and I'd love you to, ref, to come back to your observation about this new set of um, regulations that are making access to the very documents you've uncovered and made public for us through the exhibition, um, how that, how, that um, how, how, to, how to navigate and make sense of um, the current situation. Yeah. So to be very honest with you, I have different, uh, let's say, uh, hats. <laughs> <laughs> so one of them is to disobey to the law and use them as I am doing it. Uh, and I did an exhibition um, in uh, Berlin called Archive Secret Defense Point d'interrogation with, with a question mark, uh, archives, top secret. I mean, to whom actually, because they were declassified, they were open, you know, like they were part of the general domain, the public domain for many years. Uh, so 
no one like yes we know why that it's not really an excuse so they have the, there are like two kinds of laws one that says that every document that is stamped top secret secret and confidential has to be declassified by the agency that created it and knowing that all those agencies do not exist any longer as far as i know maybe they do exist and we don't know about that <laughs> but there are two secrets to be told yeah. <laughs> Um, so this is one of the laws. The other law is after 50 years, uh, the, the, the work of in public institutions, including the military um, institutions, uh, have to be public and have to be accessible, except when they are um, part of the def like defense of the country. For example, the archives that are related to the French nuclear bombs in the Sahara are classified, are not open to the public. This is something we do know about, except very, very few 154 files, but that's another question, another kind of question. So somehow the fact to, or this, uh, I mean, it, 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 I'm, I'm thinking about it while thinking also about all these efforts, you know, about the memory of, of the independence, about the colonial history of the independence, about this report that were commissioned here and there, about all these, you know, attempts of saying, okay, yes, we do need to discuss about this. So this is like one of the narrative. This is like the most like, yeah, the, the narrative that is um, somehow, <laughs> more present in, 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 in the uh, like consciousness of people, especially in France. But at the same time, all these measures of uh, closing, um, uh, obstructing, impeding, but also dictating what, what, needs, what needs to be written, what needs to be done and what, what not. So my... Um, first reaction of course was to sign petitions and to of course uh, uh, contribute and to support all the work of uh, historians and uh, of people who do work with archives so also public the public the general public but on the other hand you know the other reaction is to say like why i do have that i mean i i did work on these documents before 2020 they are part of Yes, I did sign a uh, agreement, but I did not sign another kind of agreement that says, no, I cannot, I cannot do it. So I disobey to that, not in France, because it's a crime in France. Maybe one day I can, but I, would, I'm not, I don't live there. So I, I'm, I'm not dependent on French institution or French <laughs> or France in general. So uh, for now, what I'm doing is to do the, quite the opposite, to say, this is, you know, the book is out. There are other, many other books and, and documents that are out there. So we should just keep doing our work as if, of course, we know that it exists, as if this is not. I don't know about it because it's also really, really absurd. Eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so there are several questions that have come in on the Q&A and um, look forward to, to more. Um, Andrew Belisari says that this is such fascinating work um, connected to this idea of the afterlives of French counterinsurgency theory and tactics elsewhere in the world. To what extent have you found prior French experiences in Indochina influencing, if not haunting, policy in Algeria? The idea of the people as a battlefield and the need to control territory was very much an obsession of French officers fighting against the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Um, so. Absolutely, totally yeah. agree, Andrew, absolutely. It's uh, very much so. And they also uh, say, they meaning the French officers who wrote about these policies about you know, the people as a battlefield, they openly talk about it. They openly say that that's exactly what they tried to do in um, French Indochina and it didn't work. So they have to make sure that it works in Nigeria. That's exactly the, you know, the revenge they were really, 
like working with uh, some of um, these policies were also coming from the Vichy regime. So the Second World War as well. So we have you know, this circulation of, uh, of counterinsurgency tactics and practices uh, and strategies uh, moving from the Second World War to Indochina to Algeria, and then again back to uh, France and back to Paris uh, against um, Algerian uh, workers who were also living in the bidonville, um, for example, in Nanterre in Paris, but also other places. So yes, there is a continuity there. And the, the officers celebrate that continuity as well, unfortunately. Maybe also what I try to do in one of the chapter, pacification of our counter revolution is to try trace this back to the uh, bureau uh, Arab, uh, bureau indigen, you know, like Morocco, Lyoté in Morocco, Bijou in Algeria, to see or to try to trace these continuities or these disruptions, but at least to, to uh, uh, locate the situated in this really, really long uh, life of um, people as battlefield, absolutely. Well, I think it is such a powerful um, part of your initial observations to really underscore the importance of working beyond the, the singular sites of connection to really try and think about how these ideas are circulating both within the French imperial context, but also, as you said, far beyond and into a very contemporary moment. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let me, Jennifer Sessions asked a question that returns us to the exhibition itself. Um, she was very interested in the usage of mirrors in the exhibition because it not only reflects the overlapping wallpapering of the newspaper, but also reflects the viewer's image. Was the introduction of the viewer's subjectivity and self part of the motivation to include mirrors? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> to be, to be um, yeah, very straightforward, yes. So in, in, in other um, venues, you know, we had like, like entire, like, like one plate mirror, and then also the, 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 um, like the protection of the mirror, so uh, glass above uh, or, or on the top of the of the of the document. So the, 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 there are all kinds of reflections and disruptions as well. This was for me extremely important to, you know, not exhibit really and only, but to create moments of uh, uncomfort, discomfort maybe of not knowing, of not, yeah, of not understanding, of also being confronted with one, oneself. I mean, not only myself, but the self of um, the documents, of the, of, the, of the media scandal, of some of the actors there, of us as viewers, as, as, as visitors. It's um, what also for me was extremely important not to uh, prioritize or hierarchy, hi, can you, can you create a hierarchy, oh, this is really difficult, hi, hi, how can I say? Hierarchy. Hi, hierarchy. Hierarchy, hierarchy between, between all these documents and try to keep <laughs> this insistence of, um, of the self, of the reflection, um, really, to, to be honest, almost everywhere. Right? In, in UVA, you know, we really tried to turn a classroom into an exhibition space. So we left all that space in between so that people can use it as a classroom. But in an exhibition space, this the, the, the mirroring, the reflection, this repetition, and this repetition is extremely powerful because of the spaces, because of the composition, the layout of all these tables, and, and also the the videos that are normally on the on the floor, so you can always have this repetition as well. The videos are like in on loop as well. So yes, um, it's um, it's really an invitation to reflect, but also be reflected on <laughs> on all of these um, on of these documents. What also was really important to, for for me to 
not include and I can imagine, you know, sometimes um, people are like, okay, but why? Uh, or they ask themselves, why is that? Um, it was very clear to me that um, uh, I wanted to use primarily French uh, documents and not, you know, Algerian and French and international and, and so also to try to use what we are told, you know, that we cannot work with this documents and try to subvert them or to return them against themselves or against beyond together, you know, to create all these layers. Um, and the voice of Algerians is really, for me, yeah, at least the way that I see it is exactly that, to um, show exactly that kind of reflection and repetition. And what you just, this discussion leads perfectly into the next question, which is actually kind of trying to open up the question of the exhibition as a mode of, of um, as a mode of operation. <laughs> um, so Lawrence Chua thanks you for your inspiring talk. Um, and notes that as a historian who successfully works in both text and ex exhibition formats, could you say what one media accomplishes for you that another cannot? For example, does one medium allow for narrating an anti-imperial history in a way that another doesn't? Um, and he asks this question because the UVA exhibition feels like a deton archive in which the visitor can see beyond the polished surface of the material and disentangle different meanings from the material than they might have been able to in the archive itself. Absolutely. Yes, thank you so much, Lawrence. Uh, so nice to see you here. Not to see you, but to read your next <laughs> Yeah. Um, really, the, the, the different formats or this, the media, the two media, I think, as you mentioned, really allow things, lots of things to happen. So I, I maybe the, the one, the one aspect that is really dear to me is the audience. Uh, I think the book um, is an academic book. Uh, it's sometimes too, even though I really tried to write it to, you know, to be as accessible as, as possible, to keep all the context, uh, it is a book about very specific topics. So somehow, uh, yeah, the, the, the conversation that this book might open or create are very limited in comparison to what an exhibition like this one, especially with the story and history that was on purpose kept uh, quiet and silent somehow um, in France specifically, not in other places. So the audience, the kind of conversations, the kind of influence, maybe not really influence, but impact, effect, uh, that one might go through in a space with all of these voices without framing them, even though I do say in the introduction that I, I do not think that these are camps, but uh, that these are centers, they are camps. But of course, the audience is free to think and to address and identify this as they wish, according to their background experience, discipline, et cetera, et cetera. I think also in this very case, the book, uh, in the book, I resisted or I didn't want to publish these photographs because, you know, you cannot print on it. Ach, Achtung, this is German, sorry. Uh, be careful, this is propaganda. You can't, I mean, you could, but I don't think that the university press will let you do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can't write like, so, yeah. So you have, even though you have, yes, a caption, but the caption, it's, it's very complicated and also it takes some time, not time, but like space. And it's, it's, it's quite difficult to um, avoid the repetition of, of what, ex what this image have been produced for. That for me was very clear. So what I will be doing, I will publish four of them to show you know, the four categories that the, the uh, the, 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 the tents, uh, what they call en dur, huh? and, and to say that this is really uh, made by this 
um, very office that has this kind of issues and I do have, uh, yeah, like a uh, uh, reservation uh, there. And the exhibition somehow um, allows different kinds of conversations of, of, uh, um, of experience really. I think uh, if you are confronted with so many informations that are sometimes also contradicting one another. And so for example, in one of the tables, you know, you, um, you see a, uh, uh, the construction of the camp uh, and you don't know who are these people. And that's, uh, you know, in the caption, of course, I say, okay, this, uh, I try to describe a little bit, but then you can juxtapose in this very same surface, um, a their, their military directive that is saying what they should not be doing and what is the raison d'etre of this camp. So all these clashes, I think, are really unique, at least in the way that I think of exhibitions or I think of uh, these mediums of sharing, of um, displaying and of um, inviting audiences to think uh, beyond also the knowledge that we are used to. No, yeah. I hope, Lawrence, I, I, I responded to your question. Well, it's really helpful. And I think actually provides a really great segue to a question that Emmanuel Sadda um, wanted to ask about the dialectic between visibility and invisibility that's so present in your work. Um, you know, she notes that your exhibition shows the camps were very visible. How could they not have been? They, they were so massive. But after Rocard's letter to Le Monde in 1959, there was a massive public scandal. And, you know, you include some of those, um, those articles mentioning dead children, famine in the exhibition. So all of this was very visible and known. And yet, as you as you also noted, Bourdieu and Sayad in their book from 1964 don't see much. Um, they see regroupement in the continuity of a history of colonization that is mostly a history of capitalism. Um, and so you also insist on the invisibility of the phenomenon when you talk about the unaccessible archives and the doctored photography. So how do you see this kind of dialectic between the visible site and the hidden archive? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very important question as well. And thank you for this. Um, it's, um, yeah, what I couldn't really say in this very, very short presentation is the, um, somehow the chronology or the biography of this, uh, that maybe chronology is more precise, the chronology of, of all of these camps, um, you know, the, the map was produced in 1964, so after the independence, so this is the first time, at least uh, uh, from what we know, that you, there is one uh, document that is mapping the scale of it, the location and all of that. So while these camps were being built, so during this, uh, the temporality of, 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 of that chronology, um, there, there was, I, I don't think there, there I think the, the French army did everything to really create this fragmentation of information. One had to ask for um, authorization to visit some of the camps, you know, there were, for, there were really, like uh, controlled, uh, militarily controlled camps. The, after the media scandal, they organized um, trips, visits for uh, journalists, uh, national, so French journalists, but also international journalists, but they were guided. You know, they showed them exactly what they wanted to show and not everything. So all these ways of not, how can I say this, of not um, allowing for that big picture, for that, for all these 
testimonies um, or all these experiences to be known and, and openly, let's say, at least written about, not discussed, um, I think was quite unique. And this is also part of the uh, l'état d'urgence uh, the, the, at that time. Eh? So l'état d'urgence was a state of uh, exception or emergency that was um, launched, implemented um, in 1955. Uh, and one of the uh, conditions of this state of emergency was the control of information, uh, the control meaning, you know, the censorship was something that happened. Uh, let's say it was part of the Republican uh, somehow principles at the time in the colonies, but also elsewhere. Uh, we know that there were, um, you know, books uh, about torture, for example, uh, uh, La Question, for example, it was um, censored, the Battle of Algeria, the movie yeah, of Pontecorvo was censored. So somehow there was a, an apparatus of censorship of, how can you say this, like, uh, yeah, like a kind of mechanism, a process that dictated what can be said, what can be discussed, and when I would even say what can be thought, because you know you can think what you know and you cannot think what you don't know. So that's a little bit how um, these regulations, uh, yeah, shaped and framed. The, those histories at that, those very times. But at the very same time, you know, the Algerian um, FLN, but also uh, other uh, French and, and, and other, uh, let's say, pro independence, they were also very well aware of that. So they were very active in trying to internationalize this project or this, uh, uh, this displacement or internationalize that to make this much more known about, talked about. So, uh, there was also a lot of resistance, a lot of um, counter <laughs> uh, invisibility somehow. Yeah. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I mean, I, I think maybe a, um, a good place to begin to draw our conversation to a conclusion is to ask you to talk a little bit more about how this work, and especially I think the exhibition, has created for you a springboard for the current work that you're doing on, um, on the legacies of and the history of nuclear testing in the Sahara, the relationship that you, um, that you really underscore as part of the exhibition between this mass displacement of people and the, the, the massive building of infrastructure for oil and for the expansion of the French nuclear project. So I'd love to hear you kind of um, connect the dots between this work, which in some ways is kind of ancient history for you, um, even if we're restaging it at, at EVA at a really important moment also, marking the 60th anniversary of Algerian independence. Um, but I'd love to hear you kind of think through where, where, where this material pushed you in terms of what you're working on now. Yes, thank you so much also for this question. Yeah, for me, like, you know, if this exhibition continues to travel all my life, I'm, I'm, I would be extremely happy because of, the, of, yeah, because of the scale of it. Um, but still, you know, we, we, I, I wouldn't say there is a history, a written history of, of the camps. You know, what I also try to do is to, to introduce a little bit, to try to understand the counter architecture of counterinsurgency. This is one part of it, you know, they have other, Kinds of chapters, so I, I, I wouldn't claim that I have that I have been writing the history. So the scale is really massive. The number of victims are still suffering. I think today, you know, because of the expo ex expropriation uh, from their own lands, and because of uh, um, you know the lack of attention after the independence. Even though there was uh, that they tried, I mean, the Algerian government tried to build uh, what they called the Mil Village Socialist, the 1000 Socialist Villages, it was all, again another disaster because some of these villages were almost 
like a, a, again a reflection of what was happening with the Centre de Regroupement after, so the Mille Village. So it's extremely complex, and I hope you know we should. I think I hope that this is you know or that other or that historians <laughs> continue this work and that we can keep talking about this for the next few years, centuries, whatever you know it takes to get there. <laughs> I'm super happy. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's extremely long, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, as I said before, for me, it was really an, a kind of attempt at understanding how to exhibit these materials, but how, how to make it, how to create another kind of audience and how to address, how to open up these conversations with, with uh, other, um, yeah, with, 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 with other publics somehow. Um, so then it traveled, so it was not really an intention, you know, it was not designed as a traveling exhibition, but it, it happened, which is, I think it's really fantastic for the regrouped populations. Um, but with the colonial toxicity, this is something really, really different. And, and now that I learned so much about the effect, the impact of exhibitions, on you know the media, on people, on maybe laws, maybe archives, maybe, 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 I'm much more, let's say, aware of somehow the maybe power, I don't know, of exhibition or, or of possibilities that exhibitions might um, engender or offer. So with the colonial toxicity, the French army in the Sahara, the book, let's say, it's very clear the archives are classified, so there is no negotiation. Yes, <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. We start from there. Okay. But so that's the whole question now about what kind of sources. You know, I, I again disobey to the fact that because the archives or the military archives are close to the public, then we will not write about this. That's for me not an excuse. And even though maybe historians will hate me for this, but but I think that's the whole challenge. Like what kind of evidence, what kind of sources, what, what kind you know, of, um, of material culture is there at our disposal to try to uh, unearth and to really write about, maybe not his, the history of, of all of it, but maybe suggest mm -hmm. some uh, interpretation, some sometimes speculation as well. And not knowing now is part of the process, you know, maybe. We know this about that, we know this, but we don't know about that. So that's really a theme or one should uh, thematize it also while writing about it. So with um, the exhibition, and that's an invitation I got from a, um, I know it's not public yet, but it's gonna be public at the end of, uh, of, uh, of May, but I can definitely share it with you. <laughs> um, so if I cannot dance, I don't want to be part of a revolution. It's a performance studies, um, art um, foundation in Amsterdam that invites every year three artists and three researchers. I'm part of the researchers and they can somehow think about the performativity um, of, in my case, history. So I propose to try to think of an exhibition that tries to perform colonial toxicity, that tries to create, again, uh, we can discuss about this after the opening, so, <laughs> but that's now the project um, that, that really not only portrays like the bomb or the effect of the bomb, but uh, the biography you know, of this temporality and speciality of toxicity which is like really huge because of you know, the, the fact that it did not stop in 1962 with the independence of Algeria. That's you know, radioactivity is not only in the Sahara, but it's like in Africa and you're traveling to Europe. You know, that, that kind of substance, that's, that kind of, in, this is really now invisible. You cannot see radioactivity. You can suffer from it, like your body will show what <laughs> uh, um, you have been subjected to. Um, you can see it in the landscape, uh, you can somehow measure it with an instrument, a Geiger, you know, there are all kinds of ways to make it, it close to the audience, but you cannot see it. That's really, let's say, quite, uh, uh, um, let's say, evident. 
So I propose to create an exhibition that we, is titled Performing Colonial Toxicity and to, to work with this life and temporality and speciality of this radioactivity in the Sahara, so uh, in, 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 in Algeria, knowing that the military bases that were built at the time, um, they were not all dismantled and they are, some of them are still there. Uh, there are also nuclear waste, wastes in the Sahara. Um, some of the Saharan population used radioactive materials and matters and metals to build their own uh, houses. So somehow to try really to map this radioactivity that is present, not visible, but present in that territory. So that's for me really a very, very different way of thinking or creating the designing exhibitions. Um, and this is also the aim of it. Uh, it's to claim or to demand the cleaning of these sites because that's uh, somehow, it, there is a law, but the law has not been implemented in Algeria. So you can see still that you know, people are uh, exposed to these radioactive matters in some of the areas and it's highly toxic, but it's not, it has not been cleaned. And that's for me really about accountability and responsibility. So in other, way, in other words, I am addressing directly the French government. <laughs> Well, thank you both for this incredibly rich and compelling discussion. Um, it was really, really wonderful and really interesting. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the event, there is an exhibition of Samia's work at the Bond House at UVA. It's free and open to visitors. Uh, I also want to thank those who were involved in this event and in the ex uh, exhibition itself. So thank you to our faculty partners and to our other partners at UVA, including the departments of French, history, Middle Eastern studies, and South Asian languages and cultures. Thanks, of course, to our speakers for today. Um, and special thanks to Emily Marks, Francis Capaccio, and to the students from the UVA School of Architecture who helped to uh, install the exhibition. Our next Touchstones of Democracy conversation is on Friday, April 1st, and will feature UVA historian Olivier Zunz, and he will be discussing his new biography of Tocqueville. We hope you will join us then, and thank you. <laughs>